funerals and saying Order. gravely Senator ill Macdonald relatives. Senator MacDonald, it being 2 p.m. Questions without notice. Senator Pratt. My question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. In an article this morning, Australian entitled Feds Muscle Up on Borders, the Attorney General warned state governments they may once again face High Court challenges to force their borders open. Given the Morrison Joyce government has now order, spent order, more than order. $1 Sorry, Senator million. Pratt, dollars. Senator Pratt, I'm gonna, I, 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 on my right, I have repeatedly asked for silence during questions. Could you commence from the word given? Senator Pratt, I got the pre preface to the question. Thank you. Given the Morrison Joyce government has spent more than $1 million on taxpayers, of taxpayers' money supporting Clive Palmer's High Court challenge to the West Australian borders, will the minister now guarantee that the Morrison Joyce government will not spend any more taxpayers' money on challenging Western Australia's border decisions? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President, and I am so glad that Senator Pratt read that article. And Senator Pratt, can I say, uh, the journalist completely sensationalised uh, what was said. Let me Order. be very clear to you. Let Order. me be very clear because what we have Order is Labor in Western Australia, and my Western Se Australian Order. Liberal colleagues Senator would understand this. These are just more Labor. Lies. Let me be very clear, Senator Pratt, Order. for the Channel 7, the Channel 9, the ABC Order. and the Channel 10 news tonight. The Commonwealth will not challenge Western Australia's border closures in the High Court Order. and we will not in any way support Clive Palmer. Can I be clearer? I do not believe so. What we are doing, Order, Mr Senator President, Watt, what Ramiel. we are doing is working with the states and territories through the national plan. That is what we are doing, working with the states and territories to implement the national plan Order. to reopen. And on any analysis, and my Western Australian colleagues would agree with me, we have actually done incredibly well in Western Australia. Mr McGowan has done incredibly well in keeping COVID-19 out of Western Australia. But the states and territories have now agreed to the national plan. And at 80 per cent, when 80 per cent of Australians and Western Australians are vaccinated, and I'm so pleased to see Western Australians every day, more and more of them, putting their arms out and saying, I will be vaccinated. The question becomes for Mr McGowan, if not at 80 per cent, then when? That's all it comes down to. If not at 80 per cent, then Order. when? But let me be Order. clear, the On Commonwealth will right. not challenge Western Australia's border closures in the high Order, court. Senator Cash. Across the chamber on my left and right, I know if I can't hear Senator Cash, it's not my hearing. It means there is too much noise. Senator Pratt. Has the Attorney General, Prime Minister or any other member of the government started discussions with Clive Palmer regarding future legal challenges? Order. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much. And let me make it clear again to Senator Pratt. The Commonwealth will not challenge Western Australia's border closures in the High Court, and we will not support any challenge to Western Australia's border closures by Clive Palmer. What we are doing, though, what we are doing is working with the states and territories, working with the states and territories in relation Order. to the implementation of the national plan. And in Western Australia, I understand, Mr President, we've now reached 50 per cent of Western Australians have had their first dose. That is actually a good thing. And very shortly you'll get to 60 per cent, then 70 per cent and then 80 per cent. And once we're at 80 per cent, the question does become, what do we all do at 80 per cent? But we are working with the states and territories as agreed through the National Cabinet to implement the National Order. Plan for reopening. Order. On my left and right. Order. Senator Pratt, final supplementary question. Why is the Morrison-Joyce government more focused on attacking Premier Mark McGowan and Western Australians 
rather than taking responsibility for their failures on quarantine and on the rollout of the vaccines. Again, 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 I am going to ask for silence during questions. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I certainly don't believe that I in any way knocked Mr. McGowan. In fact, what I think I said, in fact, I, what I know I said is, Mr. McGowan has done a very, very good job as the Premier of Western Australia in keeping our state relatively COVID-free. I commend Mr. McGowan for the work that is undertaken, and that is why the National Cabinet has agreed to the National Plan. For reopening. That is why the Prime Minister, every day, he goes out and he says to Australians, you understand that sticking to the national plan is the key to getting back to as normal life as we can whilst living with COVID-19. And as I said, it is very pleasing, Mr President, that over 50 per cent or 50 per cent of, Austra Pratt. of Western Australians have now received their first dose of the vaccine. That is a good thing. And we want to see more and more Western Australians receive that first dose so that we can eventually do what the national plan Order. says Senator and Cash, live time with for the COVID-19. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is Senator to Watt. the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister advise the Senate what the June 2021 national accounts demonstrate about Australia's economic performance during the COVID-19 pandemic and how the Liberals and Nationals government plan continues to protect Australians and support Australian jobs and businesses in the face of current challenges? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Hughes very much for her question. And well, Mr. President, although we continue to be in the middle uh, of a global pandemic, the greatest economic shock uh, that Australia and indeed the world have faced since the Great Depression, the Australian people and the Australian economy continue to show enormous levels of resilience. Uh, as we look at the recent period of time reflected in the national accounts figures released today, it shows that during that quarter, even with 29 days, of lockdown occurring across at least one part of the country, indeed including five out of eight jurisdictions across that quarter, we still saw strong economic growth. Real GDP growing by 0.7% in the quarter to be a record 9.6% higher throughout the year. This was clearly well above median market expectations. And this rise in GDP was broad-based, broad-based encompassing household consumption, public final demand, business investment and dwelling investment, all contributing to growth across the quarter. Our economy does, of course, continue to face significant challenges at this point in time, especially across those states still in lockdown. But it is an economy that remains bigger than it was before the lockdown. And although the Delta virus is challenging us, just as it's challenging those who struggled with COVID last year, such as the US or UK, or challenging those struggling with the Delta strain this year, such as our friends in New Zealand or others, we absolutely have the economic support in place, some $311 billion providing income support, business support and assistance, which will ensure that Australia, if we stick to the plan, getting vaccinated, reopening, is going to continue to have health and economic outcomes, very much the envy of the world through these most challenging of times. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, how does Australia's economic and health performance during the COVID-19 pandemic compare internationally? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, indeed, Australia's health and economic performance have been world leading. And we were the first advanced economy in the world to see both the size of our economy, our GDP, and our employment market jobs levels surpass those pre-pandemic levels. More than one million jobs have been created across the Australian economy since May last year. And with an estimated 160,000 more Australians in work than before the pandemic, notwithstanding the current lockdown challenges and difficulties, our unemployment rate decreased for nine consecutive months, falling to 4.6% in July. And in terms of health outcomes, while we've tragically seen millions of deaths occurring overseas and still significant daily deaths around the world, in Australia, we've saved an estimated 30,000 lives as part of that health response. Tragic though the loss of life is in Australia, there is much to be proud of in terms of the way we have managed 
uh, this pandemic and managed to do so saving the lives and livelihoods of so many of our fellow Australians. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How can all Australians play their part in delivering the national plan agreed by National Cabinet? And why is this critical to ensuring confidence in our recovery and securing Australia's future? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, our national plan is about safely opening up, safely ensuring that Australia can return to a greater level of pre-COVID normality than was the case. It's about a plan to provide confidence for business, confidence that states doing it tough like right now, like New South Wales, can see restrictions ease as vaccination rates climb, but equally confidence that states like my own in South Australia, Western Australia or elsewhere, uh, who have continued to successfully suppress COVID in, in highly suppressive ways, are equally able to be able to see a normalisation including ultimately a normalisation of travel arrangements as they too hit higher and higher vaccination rates. How Australians help us to get there is to keep churning out in record numbers getting vaccinated. Yet again, we saw huge numbers of vaccinations occur across the country yesterday, more than 330,000 doses administered, running at a per capita rate in excess of what the UK or the US have achieved at any point of their vaccine rollouts. Time it's a right way to turn it has expired. Continue. Senator McCarthy. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Does the national plan require First Nations vaccination rates to match the rest of the Australian population before reopening? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator McCarthy, for the question. Uh, the national plan, uh, which has been publicly released for everybody to see, Mr. President, contemplates uh, a number of thresholds, uh, 70 per cent and 80 per cent vaccination rates across the country, uh, in a, to facilitate a staged process to safely open up the Australian community again uh, to facilitate movement, uh, to reactivate our economy uh, in support of all Australians, Mr President. It doesn't discriminate against Indigenous or any other community, to, the, to be frank, Mr President. We want to see vaccination rates in every single community as high as possible. We urge that, Mr President. Uh, and with respect to Indigenous Australians uh, and their vaccination. That's why we prioritised them understanding the sensitivities that existed with respect to Indigenous communities. That's why we opened uh, vaccination to Indigenous Australians in Phase 1B uh, on the 22nd of March last year, Mr President. That's why we did that. We made vaccines available to Indigenous Australians very Early in the piece, Mr. President. Order. Very Order. early. Senator in the Colbeck, piece. I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Uh, on relevance, Mr. President, um, this was deliberately a very tight question about whether the plan requires First Nations vaccination rates, and we haven't had an answer on that yet. Um, well, with respect, I think um, Senator Colbeck, in I was listening very carefully because I appreciate it was a very short, sharp question. Senator Colbeck, I believe, said addressed that by saying the plan did not discriminate, I believe was the phrase he used. I believe if, to go any further would be requiring me to instruct a minister how to answer a question, but I believe he's being directly relevant through his answer thus far. A question can be debated after question time. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the plan seeks to see all Australians vaccinated as soon as possible. And can I, Mr President, join with Senator Dodson in his condemnation uh, over the last 24 hours or so, um, in an article that I've seen today, of those who are peddling anti-vaccine messages into Indigenous communities. I agree, I agree with Senator Dodson uh, fundamentally, Mr Order. President. Uh, and the government will continue to work with Indigenous communities, with state governments, uh, with the Archos, in the interests of getting as many Australians, Order. including Senator Indigenous Colbert, people, vaccinated as possible. Order. expired. Order. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. 
Will the Morrison government guarantee First Nations vaccination rates will match those of the rest of the population before reopening at 70 and 80 per cent, Minister? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the whole concept of the plan is to ensure that we can safely open the Australian community for all Australians, including Indigenous Australians. It's very important. We understood right from the outset the importance and the vulnerability of Indigenous Australians. That's why we set up a specific task force to work with the Indigenous Australians to support them through the pandemic. That's why we prioritised Indigenous Australians in Category 1B of access to the vaccine, uh, and that access was made available immediately. Uh, 1B opened on the 22nd of March this year. So Indigenous Australians have and continue to have priority access Senator to— Senator Colbeck, I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt. Again on relevance, Mr President. The these have been deliberately tight questions, and this one's about whether the government will guarantee First Nations vaccination rates. I won't read the entire thing no, out. I, but I appreciate that, Senator Watt, and I, I've been listening carefully. This would not be appropriate question to talk about a general national commentary on the national plan or vaccination, but while the minister is specifically addressing Indigenous Australians' rates of vaccinations and programs, I think that is directly relevant. There's an opportunity to debate the question after question time, but I can't instruct him on a particular word in a question. But by remaining tightly relevant to the um, terms of the question and the subject matter, I believe that it qualifies as directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. So we will continue to work with the Indigenous communities to ensure that their vaccination rates are as high as possible. We have provided specific resources. Uh, developed and tailored specifically for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander audiences to educate them and to, and to mitigate Order, the Senator negative Colbeck. messages coming Time from the some has sources. Senator McCarthy, a Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Mr President, the Prime Minister has failed to deliver on his promise to vaccinate 1B priority groups by winter and today, on the first day of spring, less than 20 per cent of First Nations Australians have been fully vaccinated. How many First Nations Australians will be unvaccinated and at risk of COVID-19 when the targets of 70 and 80 per cent are reached? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. As I've said, our objective is to ensure that all Australians have access to the vaccine, including Indigenous Australians, and that's why specific measures have been put in place by the government to ensure that they can. We continue to work closely with the Archos, who I have to say are doing a really good job in working with Indigenous communities. I again condemn, I again condemn the negative messages being spread into some Indigenous communities, and I'm sure, Senator McCarthy, you would join me in doing that, that are frightening Australian Indigenous people Order. off being vaccinated. Order. We are working with those communities. We are working with those communities. Uh, we are adapting specific programs that have been run for the more broader community, Order. specifically to Indigenous communities, so that they can understand the importance of vaccination uh, and they can that they then participate in the vaccination process, Mr. President. So we will, and we will continue to do that, understanding how important vaccination Order, is Senator to Indigenous Colbert, Australians. The answer has expired, Senator Bragg. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workplace, sorry, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister outline to the Senate how the $311 billion in direct health and economic support? provided by the Liberal and Nationals government is continuing to protect lives and livelihoods during the pandemic, and how this support is ensuring that our economy remains resilient as we implement the national plan agreed by National Cabinet. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. And uh, certainly with the release of today's national accounts, we continue to see the resilience of the Australian economy. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the coalition government, we have been focused on protecting the lives and the livelihoods of Australians. And as I've said in this place before, and certainly as the former small business minister, small businesses, though, as we know, they continue to do it tough. Many are 
in and out of lockdown. We just need to look to New South Wales, to Victoria, and here now in the ACT. And this, of course, continues to create uncertainty for them. But that is why, in terms of the policies that we are putting in place as a government, we provided in the budget this year an additional $20.7 billion in tax relief to businesses over the next four years. And this, of course, includes the extension of the immediate expensing measure, and that is helping around 99 per cent of businesses in Australia to reinvest back into their businesses. Because as Senator Bragg knows, uh, as a government, uh, we understand that there are some businesses, Senator Bragg, that have that capacity to reinvest. And we want those businesses to be able to access government policy to do exactly that. Prosper, grow, invest in their business and create more jobs for Australians. But Mr President, we also recognise that many businesses continue to face the uncertainty, and in particular uh, in terms of lockdowns. And that is why we have worked with the states and the territories through the National Cabinet to provide temporary targeted grants to small and family businesses to assist them to get through the lockdowns and to assist them in relation to the impacts of the lockdowns. We've gone further in terms of our policies by expanding our small and medium size business loan scheme. And certainly this has been appreciated Order. by Senator the business Cash. community. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How are the government's business investment incentives helping Australian businesses to grow, prosper and create jobs for Australians? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, when you look at the business investment numbers that came out uh, for the June quarter, what they showed was business investment was actually up by 4.4 per cent. And importantly, non-mining investment was up by 6 per cent, and it's now up by 15 per cent for the year. This is actually the strongest growth in non-mining investment in more than 13 years. That is a good thing for this sector. And the significant increase is a result of our government's measures to incentivise businesses, even during these challenging times, again, to invest, to invest back into themselves through the immediate expensive expensing measure. If you look at order books across Australia, they're actually filling up. And again, that is a good thing for those businesses who have that capacity to invest. They're replacing old equipment with new equipment, utilising the government's policies. And what this does is assist in their efficiency and ultimately Order. their productivity. Senator, Cash, Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you. How is the national plan giving small and family businesses the confidence they need so we can secure Australia's future? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the national plan, and as we know, this is an agreement. Uh, national Cabinet, the Commonwealth Government, agreed by all states and territories. This is our pathway forward in learning to live with COVID-19 and at the same time get back to the freedoms that we've given up in so many instances to combat COVID-19. What the national plan is doing when you talk to businesses, and in particular small businesses around Australia, it sends them that message of hope. They know there is now a clear plan to move through various stages. It gives them that hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel. This is actually giving businesses the confidence that they need. And obviously, part of that national plan is increasing vaccination rates across Australia. In the last 14 days, we've seen over 3.7 million vaccinations across our nation. That is a good thing, and Australians, they should be commended for that. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator McKenzie, representing the Minister for Agriculture in Northern Australia. Three years ago, more than 100 dogs died as a result of eating a particular brand of dry dog food. Since then, no effective action has been taken. Now, in fact, in recent weeks, there's been a spate of dog deaths linked to tainted raw pet meat. Now, pet owners have been waiting for more than three years since the last Senate inquiry that I instigated to see action on pet food safety. Now, we have been advised that the report of the Minister's Pet Food Working Group would be considered by state agriculture ministers last month, and now it seems this won't happen until next month, maybe. Minister, why have agriculture ministers still not met to discuss this report? What is the delay 
And why isn't there more urgency, given that we keep having more dog deaths while we wait? Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture in Northern Australia, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Griff, uh, not only for his question, but for his concern on behalf of pet owners across the country. The pet food, uh, I'm advised the Pet Food Working Group was established with agreement of all agriculture ministers, is currently finalising its advice to the ministers. Uh, the report of the Pet Food Working Group will be considered by agriculture senior, senior officials in September 2021, so this month. Uh, so it has to go to those senior officials before then going to um, state and federal agricultural ministers at their MINCO, uh, which is planned to be held next month for decision. I, uh, Minister Littleproud has responded to the letter signed by the RSPCA, the Australian Veterinary Association and the Pet Food Industry Association, informing them of the status of the report of the Pet Food Working Group. He's also written to agriculture ministers uh, across the country to inform them of expected timing for advice to be received from the Pet Food Review Working Group as implementation of any regulatory options for pet food remains a decision for state and territory governments. So it comes to the MINCO uh, next month. It will then be up to each and every state and territory to then return home to their jurisdiction and implement uh, any decision that that body makes. Now, some are obviously going to be quicker at doing that than others. Some will have more will at doing that than others. When making their decision, Minister Littleproud has asked ministers to consider the working group report and the desire by many for a positive outcome for pet and pet owners when deciding on the best way forward to ensure the safety of pet food. Uh, he is also aware of the report of deaths in pet dogs linked to the consumption of raw pet meat from a knackery in Victoria. Since the end of May, it has been reported that at least 24 pet dogs have died and 68 Order. have been Senator hospitalised McKenzie. in Victoria. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Minister, the RSPCA, the Australian Veterinary Association, and the industry peak body, the Pet Food Industry Association, have also taken issue, of course, with the delayed reforms, and they are particularly calling for a mandatory standard and mandatory recalls, as the Senate inquiry recommended. Will the states entertain these particular recommendations, or are they doomed? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Griff. Well, as I um, outlined in my previous answer, these, this will be a decision for state and territory ministers whether to adopt. Uh, mandatory or voluntary regulatory framework. Uh, so that decision obviously isn't going to be made till next month. So it's a bit premature um, to be making a call on that. That's obviously a decision for those ministers in that forum. But the bodies you spoke about, the RSPCA, the Australian Veterinary Association and the Pet Food Industry Association's concerns uh, have been made clear, not just to the Federal Agriculture Minister, but I imagine uh, to jurisdictional ministers as well. Um, Agriculture Victoria and Prime Safe, as the responsible regulatory agencies in Victoria, led the investigation to um, the dog deaths that I, and hospitalisations I mentioned in my earlier answer. Um, and they found that there was a toxin found in native plants in northern Australia has been conf confirmed as Order, the cause. Senator McKenzie. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Yes, Minister, I appreciate what you're saying and the fact that the states do have the final say, but a key issue has been no proper mechanism on a national basis for mandatory recalls. Should the states opt not to do what the industry associations wish to do, would you or would the Minister consider dealing and working out some format that could work on a national basis? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Well, there are strong food safety regulatory controls in place to prevent pet meat entering the human food supply chain, but I do appreciate you are speaking uh, about the animal uh, food supply chain. Responsibility uh, for the domestic oversight of raw pet meat and processed pet food sits with the states and territories. The Commonwealth's responsibilities extend to regulation and certification of exported pet food and addressing the biosecurity risks of imported pet food. 
Um, as I said, the minister has welcomed uh, the parliamentary inquiry into pet food industry, and our government's response to the recommendations was tabled in parliament on the 18th of June. Um, and your report considers recommend that the report that is coming before senior officials and um, the agriculture ministers over coming months considers the recommendations of your Senate uh, committee report and will include regulatory and non-regulatory options to manage the health Order, and safety Senator of pet McKenzie. food in Senator Australia. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. Can the minister inform the Senate of the ongoing investment by the Liberal and Nationals government into water infrastructure projects in Queensland. The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. And thank you, Senator Canavan, for your question and your continuing champion of critical water projects for Queensland. Providing vital infrastructure to regional Australia is key to our nation's recovery from COVID-19, and getting water out infrastructure out into regional Australia will provide them for a great platform to grow and prosper. We need it for the businesses that underpin our regional communities, create local jobs and support the way of life of thousands of regional Australians who wouldn't want to live anywhere else other than, I would say, Senator Canavan in central Queensland, with uh, respect to you and your colleague. The Liberal National Government is getting on with the job of building new water infrastructure to meet the needs of regional Australia. Projects such as Rookwood Weir and the proposed Urana Dam are key elements to delivering for regional Australians who rely on vital water infrastructure. Since the establishment of the National Water Grid Fund in 2015, the Australian Government has committed $1.9 billion towards water infrastructure projects in Australia, 30 construction projects, eight of which are complete, six are underway, and a further eight are expected to start construction uh, in this financial year. Major projects under construction include the Rookwood Weir, a $183.6 million Australian government commitment that will support 200, 200 jobs during construction, and the Mariba Dimbula water supply scheme, an $11.6 million Australian government commitment due for completion in early 2022. Uh, when we come to the Emu Swamp Dam, a project near Stanhope constructing a 12 gigalitre dam on the uh, Severn 7. Seven uh, River. The dam will increase water security and provide growers with the confidence and certainty to expand agriculture production. Further, we've committed $4.8 million in Queensland through the grid uh, connections funding pathway. This is an initiative about driving the construction of smaller scale projects to improve water security and reliability right across the nation. Order. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. What are the benefits of projects such as Rookwood Weir? and the proposed Urana Dam, especially in terms of supporting reliable power and jobs in North Queensland. Senator McKenzie. I want to acknowledge the efforts of my National Party colleagues in the other place, the member for Dawson, George Christensen, and the member for Capricornia, Michelle Landry, who have been both uh, very, very strong advocates for the Rookwood Weir and the Urana Dam project. The proposed Urana Dam project will be transformational as it will open up vast tracts of high-use agricultural land and create more than 1,800 jobs during construction and in operation. It will provide vital water security to the region and additional water storage of up to 1.5 million megalitres and facilitate an irrigation project of up to 25,000 hectares. Water for the project will underpin the need of the Burdekin's beef, sugar, fruit and vegetable industries, keeping our farmers producing the top quality foods they're renowned for. The planned Urana Dam will also be a hydro power station that will help back up the solar power and renewables in the regions, and it will back up the power needs of North Queensland for approximately eight hours. We've also committed an additional $7.5 million to the Wookwood Weir Senator project. Senator McKenzie. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, how is the development of water infrastructure more broadly enabling growth in regional Australia? And why is this important to unlocking the value of our regions to help secure a recovery from COVID-19? Senator McKenzie. Well, we are growing regional Australia by adding the one ingredient you must have to grow anything, and that's water. 
In the 2021 budget, the Liberal and Nationals government invested a further $258 million from the $3.5 billion National Water Grid Fund. This includes funding towards 12 new priority water infrastructure projects. And since 2015, our government has committed $1.8 billion for 30 projects. Our investments will provide water into the future and unlock the economic potential for new and expanded agriculture. New or augmented projects include the Urella Badella Southern Storage Project in New South Wales, the Werribee Irrigation District modernisation and recycled water on the Bellarine, the project in Victoria, the Warwick Recycled Water for Agriculture Recycled Water Treatment Upgrade Project in Queensland. And we've also delivered eight projects that are fully operational in South Australia and the Scottsdale Irrigation Scheme in Tasmania. Our investments will secure Order, the future Senator of the regions. McKenzie. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Morrison government MPs have asked the Prime Minister to fund chaplains in every school to allay young people's concerns about climate change. Minister, does your government seriously believe it's climate experts and activists that are robbing children of hope? Is it your government's view that the best way of dealing with climate concerns is with religion and prayer? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Hanson Young for the question. As far as I'm aware, Senator Hanson Young was not in the coalition party room yesterday, did not hear the type of comments that were being made, and I can tell her through you, Mr. President, that she is completely misguided in the way in which she is characterising those remarks. It is certainly true uh, that coalition members and senators have expressed their strong support for a program that provides assistance to young people uh, in terms of navigating the many challenges of life, but particularly at these times where we see enormous additional stresses as a result of COVID-19 being placed on many young people in the environments in which they're studying and seeking to move ahead. So many young Australians have missed out on the traditional rites of passage or normal activities that go through in their schooling lives. Uh, and this has created enormous additional stresses and pressures. And the work, indeed, of teachers, of educators, of school chaplains, of psychologists, of all of those who are supporting young Australians through these challenging and difficult times is to be commended uh, and indeed to be supported in terms of the assistance they're providing. Now, young Australians know that there are many different challenges they face in the world, uh, but of course, for them individually to get ahead, what's most important is for them to receive the opportunities of education and the opportunities of employment. And as a government, our focus very clearly is on delivering those opportunities. And when it comes to tackling climate change that you raised, Senator, it's about making sure that we tackle it in ways that don't hurt the opportunities for young Australians to get a job. Our technology, not taxes, approach to tackling climate change is about ensuring Australia's economy transitions, transitions in ways that give young Australians the best possible opportunity to still get a job, to still live in a country with one of the best living standards in the world, but to do so while we drive ourselves towards uh, the ambition of net zero emissions. That's the best pathway forward to give hope and opportunity to young Australians, to give them a job, to give them the support that can give them confidence to succeed. Order. And Senator we're going to have to have created so has many expired. jobs. Senator Hanson Young, a uh, supplementary you. question. Thank you, Mr President. The US, UK and the world's leading scientists are pleading with the Australian government to commit to a stronger 2030 target ahead of the COP summit in Glasgow in November. Will you be sending chaplains to Glasgow to allay the concerns of world leaders? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, you know, the Greens come in and pretend that they want us to take issues seriously and then feed up drivel like that. And the reality is we're going to go to Glasgow with some very strong messages, some very strong messages. We'll go to Glasgow with the strong message that Australia, in terms of our Kyoto 1 target and our Kyoto 2 target, has met and exceeded those targets. And unlike many countries in the world, when we've made a commitment, we've delivered upon it. We'll go to Kyoto with firm policies that we've outlined in terms of our investment in renewable energies, our investment in other technologies, but crucially, the stretch goals we've outlined that don't just talk about how to get to net zero or don't just talk about achieving net zero, but talk about how to get to net zero, how to get to net zero through investment in hydrogen, how to get to net zero through investment in low emission steel, in low emissions aluminium, 
how to get to net zero through investment in soil carbon. We'll be going to Glasgow with very clear policies, very clear plans, and a track record that frankly Order. exceeds Senator that of Birmingham. other countries. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary. Thank you, question. Mr. President. Will the government rule out funding more chaplains as a way of dealing with young people's legitimate climate concerns and instead put a halt to the expand of fossil fuels and a proper 2030 target? Or is your government's new policy on climate change thoughts and prayers? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, a uh, pre scripted question there from Senator Hanson Young, no doubt designed to be able to distribute it on, uh, on social media platforms, but not listening at all to the answers that I've given today. The answers I've given today are outlining exactly what we intend to take to Glasgow in terms of our ambitions to drive towards net zero, but more importantly, our plans, our track record, plans and track record that show Australia doesn't just make vague promises, Australia delivers on our promises. Australia is investing as a nation in terms of investment that sees us have investment in renewable and rooftop solar at rates far and above much of the rest of the world. In terms of investment by government in the technology changes that will drive us forward as a country while preserving the job opportunities for young Australians. That is what the Greens should be caring about, getting that mix right that gives us a low emissions pathway, but also ensures young Australians can still have the job opportunities that our government has delivered in record numbers. And we have seen, as I said Order. in the earlier answer today, million jobs generated Time recently and our aim is for many more. Inspired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence. It's almost two years since the then Defence Minister, Senator Reynolds, advised on 6PR radio that a decision would be made on the location of the Collins full cycle dockings by December 2019. Another Christmas has passed. It looks like a third Christmas will pass without a decision being made. What is standing in the way of a decision being made and when will the uncertainty associated with the Collins workforce down in Adelaide uh, be resolved. The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patrick for the question and some advance notice uh, of the topic. Uh, may I say, uh, in response, uh, Mr President, uh, I disagree with the, uh, the point Senator Patrick made at the end of his question. Uh, the government has been very clear in relation to uh, the activities uh, both in, uh, in South Australia and Western Australia, which are vital uh, to the sustainment of the, uh, the submarine fleet. Uh, the decision has not been made in relation to the future location for Collins class submarine full cycle docking, uh, and it is the view of the government that uh, we should consider the options uh, that are put to government after full examination uh, by the appropriate uh, agencies uh, in due course, and we will do that, as we have consistently said. Uh, and I want to assure the Senate and assure Senator Patrick that a decision on Collins class submarine full cycle docking location doesn't impact. Uh, on the currently planned work on the life of type extension activities for uh, the Collins class submarine. It is important that the process that is underway is allowed to conclude uh, and uh, when an announcement is ready to be made, it will be made. It will be made about, uh, based on what is in our national interests after the proper consideration of all of the relevant information and advice that is brought to government. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, it's not, it's not in dispute that the government intends to conduct the life of type extension during the full cycle dockings. It's a significant body of work involving the change out of the submarine's main motor. It involves the change out of the submarine's diesels and significant electrical switchboard work. Does the minister agree that shifting full cycle dockings whilst at the same time embarking on a significant life of type extension will simply alter the risk profile too far uh, for the shift to occur. Senator Payne. Uh, no, Mr President. Um, the, in response to Senator Patrick's supplementary question, that is not the view uh, of the government. Uh, we've been obviously planning the extension of the service life of the Collins-class submarines uh, for some time. In fact, the planning commenced in uh, 2011. Uh, this government is actually uh, progressing the work itself. 
Uh, both defence and industry are continuing to progress the Collins class submarine life of, of type extension work on schedule uh, to support the first boat that will need an extension. That's HMAS Farncombe uh, and commencing in mid 2026. Uh, all six submarines will undergo life of type extension within the budget uh, that is uh, currently allocated, extending the life of each submarine by 10 years. And we are engaging uh, all of the expertise that we need to progress that life of type extension program uh, successfully. Uh, that includes support from sub-COCMS sub to de-risk the delivery of the life of type uh, extension activities. But I don't agree Order. with the proposition Senator, Senator, Payne, Senator Patrick put time. at the beginning of his question. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, I've been contacted by businesses uh, that are involved in the full cycle dockings here in South Australia, and there can be no question that the uncertainty of the future location of full cycle dockings is having an impact on business investment and uh, things like training of workforces and long term planning. Does the minister concede that the delays in the decision-making process is affecting business decisions? Order, Senator Patrick. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I, I note the observations that uh, that Senator Patrick uh, has made, but I would also note uh, that this government's commitment to shipbuilding in South Australia is frankly unparalleled, and that includes the sort of work that uh, Senator Patrick is referring to. Our commitment is to building up to 23 vessels at Osborne, which totals over $120 billion out to the 2050s. Uh, it, uh, it sees the offshore patrol vessels uh, being built at Osborne by Lurson Australia, which is directly employing up to 400 workers. That includes some transitions from the um, Air Warfare Destroyer program that uh, we successfully reformed and delivered. It includes the work of BAE Systems Maritime Australia, which is ramping up its production efforts with prototyping for the Hunter-class frigates. Uh, it includes the transformation of the Osborne Naval Shipyard itself into the National Hub for Advanced Manufacturing of the most complex vessels uh, for the Royal Australian Navy. Order, uh, Senator the... Payne. Time for the answer has expired. Sen Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. When did the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Joyce, make the final decision on the inland rail alignment in Queensland? When did Mr. Joyce advise Mr. Littleproud and Senator Macdonald of his decision? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, the Inland Rail Project is one of the most iconic nation-building projects this Australia, that Australia has ever seen, and it has been delivered by the National Party in a Liberal National Government. Warren Truss announced the project as Infrastructure Minister, and since then it is uh, a, a very proud government that has stood by and watched this project proceed through the various iterations to see its fulfilment. We've now got track uh, being laid out right through uh, northwest New South Wales as it makes its way uh, north and south between um, Brisbane and Melbourne. It's a once-in-a-lifetime investment in uh, regional Australia, and as the current Deputy Prime Minister calls it, it will be absolutely a corridor of commerce. And I know some of senators uh, who take an interest in regional Australia's growth and development will have seen a fantastic... Order, um, order. Senator McKenzie. Senator Keneally on a point of order. It is relevance, and I, I, I know the minister is speaking to something important, but it is a very tightly worded question. It just seeks to know when did the deputy prime minister make the final decision, and when did he advise Mr. Littleproud and Senator Macdonald? Yeah, There's I, no embroidery. It is just a simple I, I, factual question. I think the question goes to decision making, the alignment, and passing on of that to others. Like there are multiple elements of the question, but it goes to that. And I have been listening, but I'm going to ask you to turn to those elements of the question, Senator McKenzie, having been speaking for a minute, rather than a general description of the project. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you. Well, in terms of the route decision, uh, there has been no change to where that has been planned through 
a whole variety of infrastructure ministers uh, over many, many years. There has been many studies and plans done, uh, on, particularly on the border to Gowrie route. Cabinet have agreed to a, a route, and uh, we as a government are sticking to that. I don't know. We don't need more reviews into this. The local community has been consulted. Uh, the local MPs have been consulted, and my understanding is that Senator, uh, Senator Mackenzie, I have Senator Keneally on a point of order. Again, rather Vince, it was a very specific question. When did the Deputy Prime Minister make the final decision? Um, I, I think, with respect, the question re, um, did ask that. Um, it asked about the alignment, and it asked about whether others were advised. I do believe the minister is being directly relevant when she was speaking about the route. I can't instruct them how to answer a question. The minister referred to decision-making upon a route by the cabinet. I, I, I can't rule that as not directly relevant to the question being asked. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much. Well, um, I'm very happy to table the alignment of the inland rail route that's been agreed. That's been agreed for a long period of time, uh, and that is actually cabinet has re-examined that and absolutely backs the decision of infrastructure ministers and the current route as it stands, and that will not be changing. Order. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, it's been reported that, along with Senator Macdonald, Mr Joyce recently met with community groups who felt misled by him over the inland rail route. Did Mr Joyce indicate at this meeting with community groups in Mr Littleproud's electorate or to his National's colleagues that he would consider an alternate route? Senator Mackenzie. Oh, well, Senator Watt, I have been very clear, as has the Deputy Prime Minister, as has uh, the Deputy Leader of the Nationals. All National Party Cabinet Ministers support the decision of Cabinet, support the current route of the inland rail, uh, and they have been very, very clear about that. We want to go to one. What is clear also is that Labor has opposed the inland rail order. from the start. Senator McKenzie, start. Senator Watt, on a point of order. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I'll leave aside the misrepresentation uh, Senator McKenzie just made, given Labor started this Senator whole project. Senator Watt, please come to uh, the point of order. The point of order is relevance. The point of order is relevance. The question is about the meeting that Mr. Joyce had with Senator Macdonald and community groups, and what was said to those community groups in that meeting. Um, the minister answered that part of the question, or was answering that part of the question, by um, um, If I could rule, Senator Watt, please. Um, I will let that glancing comment by Senator Mackenzie pass, as you said you would in your point of order. But the minister was answering the question by talking about the decision-making of the route and who supported it, it being a decision of the government. I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question, and there's a time to debate them in 10 minutes. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Now, this might come because uh, I just will read to the Senate the statement um, from the DPM I made on the 25th of August 2021. The inland rail alignment is settled. It has been refined over a number of years, and delivery is well underway. As I mentioned in my uh, first answer to you, the border to Gowrie section that includes the Condamine crossing has been developed by world-leading rail engineers experts and enhanced through community consultation. ARTC's flood modelling and the reference design for the crossing of the Condamine floodplain has been thoroughly Order. reviewed. Senator McKenzie, time for the answer has expired. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. A private text message from Mr Littleproud to Mr Joyce, which happened to be published in The Australian, reads, and I quote, The Milmerran guys you spoke to on Friday would have preferred you either told them on Friday this or told them before a public statement from you. Why did Mr Joyce refuse to listen to Mr Littleproud's constituents and to his Nationals colleagues and instead announce publicly that the inland rail line was settled and well underway? Senator Mackenzie. Uh, because, because, Senator Watt, that's exactly what the inland rail project is about. We have decided a route. The government has, as I've said, reviewed it. We've got the environmental impact statement. We've got route reviews, multiple studies, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven 
different reviews. The government is very committed to the current alignment. That is what we're committed to delivering on. And that is absolutely what the Deputy Prime Minister wants to see happen and uh, what the local community wants to see happen. I'm very happy to table third party endorsements from the community uh, affected. As I was saying, the panel's draft report uh, that's the panel of experts on flood studies in Queensland, found that the work undertaken by the ARTC would to be predominantly in accordance with national guidelines and current industry best practice. The Border to Gowrie section has been subject to multiple studies and reviews. In 2020, a further independent Order, assessment Senator confirmed— Order, Senator McKenzie. Time for the answers expired. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Hear, hear, indeed. Can the Minister advise the Senate how Australia is working with partners in our region to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic and how to support our region's economic recovery as soon as possible, helping to ensure that we can all recover stronger together? The Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Scar for his question and for his deep and abiding interest in uh, the neighbourhood and the Pacific. Our neighbourhood uh, continues to face unprecedented challenges from COVID, and no nation is immune from the virus, but we must tackle it together. And this government's getting on with the job of shaping a region which is safer healthier and more prosperous for all of us. Uh, we've now gifted over 2.1 million life-saving vaccines to our neighbourhood, because until everyone is safe from COVID, nobody is safe. And similarly, hundreds of thousands of Australian jobs depend on strong economic growth across our region. To support that growth, in 2021, we delivered a record $1.7 billion in support to the Pacific over 50 per cent higher than when Labor were last in office. And we've delivered over $1 billion in support to Southeast Asia. Together with a $1.5 billion loan to Indonesia, this represents our largest funding to Southeast Asia since the 2004 tsunami. Beyond our existing aid program, we've already delivered uh, nearly $200 million in emergency economic support to the Pacific. In Fiji, this funding is supporting social protection payments to the most vulnerable benefiting more than 100,000 Fijians. In Timor-Leste, we are supporting new infrastructure projects in more than half the nation's 450 villages, directly benefiting communities and economic recovery. In Solomon Islands, we're improving water supplies for more than 4,000 households and sanitation facilities for over 2,000 households. And we're rolling out critical infrastructure support in the region that support Pacific nations' long-term economic aspirations. We're investing in ports, roads, airports, energy generation and transmission and telecommunications. Our high-quality loan financing is in high demand. These are projects that will create jobs and unlock new opportunities, ushering an even stronger era of growth growth and partnership Order, between Senator Australia Selger. and the Pacific. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I'm pleased the minister touched on uh, assistance to Fiji in particular, and I note Queensland has a wonderful Fijian diaspora. Could the minister provide further detail with respect to how Australia is working with Fiji in their fight against COVID-19? And what support is Australia providing to the people of Fiji at this critical time? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. And Senator Scar, you're right to reference the outstanding uh, diaspora here in Australia, and including in Brisbane. Fiji is one of Australia's closest partners in the region. Uh, the pandemic is having a grave impact on Fiji's people. Uh, but we're proud to be supporting our Fiji and Vivali at this time of need. Uh, in addition to our long-standing development program, we've provided over $80 million in emergency budget support to Fiji. We are directly funding doctors and nurses in the Fijian health system, and we've donated over 860,000 Australian vaccines. Now, with our support and our vaccines, Fiji is delivering a world-leading vaccine rollout with first-dose coverage of over 95 per cent of their target population an incredible performance. And we now have dispatched three Australian and New Zealand medical teams to Fiji. These teams have helped to save countless Fijian lives. Their efforts and their sacrifices will not be forgotten. As Fiji sent its military to help Australia rebuild from the 2020 bushfires, Order. we too Senator are standing Seselja. by our partners the in their expired. time of need. Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr President. If I could lift the focus perhaps to uh, the Pacific more generally, noting the outstanding contribution of Pacific workers 
to the Queensland economy. Could I ask the minister how is the Liberal and National Government assisting regional Australian businesses to access more Pacific workers as part of the national plan agreed by National Cabinet? And why is this important to securing our recovery from the pandemic, including in my home state of Queensland? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, and it's an outstanding question. Since our Pacific Labor Initiatives recommenced in September last year, more than 10,600 Pacific workers have arrived from seven participating Pacific nations and Timor-Leste. In the next few weeks, another 1,000 Pacific workers will arrive, with a further 27,000 Pacific workers ready and waiting to come to Australia. Now, this is immediate action to address workforce shortages in regional Australia as part of the PM's commitment to double Pacific workers in Australia by March of 2022. We'll shortly announce practical improvements to these programs to offer greater flexibility and less red tape for Australian employers. These changes will boost uh, welfare, worker welfare and deliver Pacific workers who, throughout COVID-19, have proven themselves to be the lifeblood of regional business, ensuring meat could be processed and crops could be harvested. Uh, these programs are a win-win for Australia and our Pacific family. We look forward to welcoming more Pacific workers and to the invaluable Order. contribution Senator, they make to Australia the at this challenging expired. time. Senator Cash. President, and uh, I would now ask that all further questions be placed on notice, and I would also seek leave to move a motion to provide for the consideration of a motion. Is leave granted? It is. No. Senator Cash. Thank you. I move that A. A motion relating to the 70th anniversary of the security treaty between Australia, New Zealand and the United States of America may be moved immediately by the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne, and B, the time limit for the debate be 45 minutes, after which the question be put, and senators may speak to the motion for not more than 10 minutes each. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Payne, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr President, I move that the Senate A notes that today marks the 70th anniversary of the alliance between Australia and the United States of America under the ANZUS Treaty. B reaffirms the commitment of Australia to that alliance, recognising its fundamental importance to our nation's security, sovereignty and prosperity, and to meeting the opportunities and challenges of our time. C acknowledges that the alliance has underpinned peace, stability and freedom in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond, and that American leadership remains indispensable to the rules-based order. D acknowledges that next week marks the 20th anniversary of the September 11 terrorist attacks, in response to which the ANZUS Treaty was invoked. E places on record its profound gratitude to the servicemen and women of both our nations who have served together over more than a century. And F acknowledges that the enduring friendship between our nations is underpinned by shared liberal democratic values and principles, and these have been embraced by our peoples across generations. Today, Mr President and colleagues, marks, of course, the 70th anniversary of the signing of the ANZUS Treaty between Australia, New Zealand and the United States. In 1951, the world was still recovering from the horrors of World War II, and Australia's foreign policy was driven by a need to safeguard peace and security in our region. What Australia sought and what we found in the United States was a partner with whom we could work to build a better future. As he signed the ANZUS Treaty in 1951, Australia's then ambassador to the United States, Sir Percy Spender, said the treaty marked, and I quote, the first step in the building of the ramparts of freedom in the vast and increasingly important area of the Pacific Ocean. He described how the alliance was conceived not in hostility to any country, but in a devout dedication to the cause of peace. The truth of this description has never been more relevant than it is today. Over 70 years, ANZUS has helped us to achieve this goal. It continues to do so today, and we're determined that as our region faces new challenges, it will do so in the future. The treaty is more than just a collective defence agreement. It provides a framework for how our two countries have worked and continue to work together to foster and sustain a region that benefits all countries. 
It is an alliance based on shared values and principles, reflecting our commitment to international peace, democracy, freedom and the rule of law. It remains a cornerstone of Australian foreign policy, just as US leadership remains indispensable to stability and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. Australia and the United States have been reliable and steadfast allies, standing shoulder to shoulder during our darkest days. For over 100 years, our troops have fought side by side, from World War I to World War II, from Korea to Vietnam, from Iraq to Afghanistan. And then 20 years ago, this month, Australians watched some of the most distressing scenes imaginable playing out on their television screens. As the 9-11 attacks unfolded in the United States, Australians felt a deep sense of shock and horror at the events that had taken place. In the days that followed, then Prime Minister Howard invoked the ANZUS Treaty, a step no Australian Prime Minister or US President had taken before. Prime Minister Howard's decision reflected the gravity of the situation, the scale of the attack and Australia's unwavering commitment to the alliance. Following this invocation of ANZUS, Australia, along with the United States and many other forces, many other nations, committed forces to Afghanistan, where our men and women have had each other's backs for the last 20 years. There will be time, Mr President, to debate the military mission in Afghanistan, but for today, let me pay tribute to the 41 Australians and the more than 2,400 American military personnel who lost their lives in Afghanistan, including the 13 US service members killed last week, helping others to seek safety. In my roles as Foreign Minister and as Minister for Women, I am focused on ensuring the gains made particularly for women and girls in Afghanistan are not eroded. Mr President, our alliance finds strength not just in its endurance, but in how it's evolved to meet the challenges of our times, including the global pandemic with which we are dealing now, with wide-reaching health, economic and social implications. The pressure on the international rules, norms and institutions that underpin the sovereignty of nations and the peace and trade between them. A changing climate that is impacting our environment, economies and way of life. Malicious cyber activity that is growing in frequency and sophistication and the emergence of new and evolving threats such as foreign interference and disinformation that are being used to manipulate open societies. The partnership today between Australia and the United States is one of trust, grown through decades of cooperation and burden sharing and recognition that each partner brings our own perspective. We are working more closely than ever with regional partners, including Japan and India, the Pacific and ASEAN, to address the key health, economic and security challenges of our time. We are modernising our militaries, including through cooperation in guided missile technology, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter and hypersonics, for example. We are collaborating on world-class science, technology and innovation, from the latest medical advances to new forms of renewable energy to the Moon to Mars initiative. We're strengthening the resilience of supply chains, including for critical minerals and rare earths. We're working together to deliver COVID-19 vaccines across the Pacific. We're driving a positive and proactive agenda to foster a free, open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific region. Our partnership today goes beyond collective defence and security agreements. It touches the lives of every Australian in a multitude of ways. The United States is Australia's biggest source of foreign investment. More than 320,000 Australians are employed by majority-owned US companies in Australia. When I visited the United States in May this year, Secretary of State Antony Blinken pledged to me that the United States would not leave Australia alone on the field. His commitment embodies the spirit of ANZUS. Neither of our two countries stands alone. Across the three 
US administrations with which I have worked. I can, sincerely, I can sincerely say that the shared commitment to the Alliance has been constant and enduring. The ANZUS Treaty has provided the unbreakable foundation for our Alliance to mature and prosper for 70 years. In 1951, Sir Percy Spender recognised only too well the dangers inherent in division. But in our alliance with the United States, he saw a commitment to, and again I quote, constantly labour to reduce the unhappy tension which today plagues mankind, unquote. Mr President, I can say emphatically that for 70 years we have indeed strived together to build peace and stability for our region. We have stood together in the face of wars, threats of terrorism and great power rivalry. Despite the uncertain times in which we live, our relationship with the United States, with the ANZUS Treaty at its heart, will continue to meet the challenges ahead. We look forward to continuing our work with President Biden and his administration to work for a better, healthier, safer and more prosperous future for all. Senator, Senator Wong? Sorry, I don't, have, you, I don't have a list. My apologies. Senator Wong. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I'm pleased to speak on behalf of the opposition to join with uh, Minister Payne uh, in supporting this motion to celebrate and commemorate the 70th anniversary of the ANZUS Treaty. Mr President, in the days ahead, much attention will be focused on what conclusions are to be drawn from the 20-year war in Afghanistan, which came to an end this week. But whatever may be said in that debate, what is beyond dispute is the constancy of the bond between the United States and Australia through the struggles in Afghanistan and beyond. And throughout the final days in Kabul, America was steadfast as an ally and a dependable friend. Because if it weren't for the presence and courage of our American allies, efforts to evacuate thousands of Australians and visa holders in the past weeks would have never been possible. And that presence came at great cost, losing 13 of their own as they sought to help others. Their ultimate sacrifice reflects the heavy duty of leadership. And it is a weight that America has carried since World War II, where the origins of ANZUS are to be found in the war in the Pacific and, of course, Prime Minister Curtin's turn to America. In late December 1941, three weeks after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Curtin declared, without any inhibitions of any kind, I make it quite clear that Amer Australia looks to America free of any pangs as to our traditional links or kinship with the United Kingdom. Curtin was attacked by those who would become today's Liberal Party. And the American President Franklin Roosevelt was astonished because Curtin was ahead of the US in thinking about strategy and priorities for the war in the Pacific. The US 7th Fleet was formed in Brisbane in 1943 and Australia fought with the US in major sea battles of the Pacific. And General Douglas MacArthur used Australia as his launching pad for the Pacific land battles, which eventually saw the defeat of Japan. In armed conflicts over more than a century, the military forces of Australia and the United States have worked together to secure our shared strategic interests. And the vehicle that gives principal expression to our sense of common security purpose is the ANZUS Treaty, whose 70th anniversary we mark today. ANZUS arose in the broader context of the post-war settlement and the Cold War, the Korean War to our north, and provided the strategic framework for dealing with the re-emergent militarism as a possible threat to security in the Pacific. The treaty underwent a fundamental transformation at the hands of Bob Hawke's Defence Minister, my friend Kim Beasley, and his US counterpart, Casper Weinberger, in the mid-1980s. They reoriented ANZUS from a threat-based agreement to one that focused on the strategic aspirations and purposes of both parties. Of course, thankfully, our partnership with the US is not as controversial today, and it has enduring bipartisan support, and much strategic cooperation has happened since. Looking forward, Australia's alliance with the United States sits at the centre of the 2020 Defence Strategic Update. With the US again engaged in a global force, force posture review, it is time for Australia to look again at our own posture to ensure that it fully meets the times, the last one having been conducted by the most recent Labor government in which I was minister. 
So I reiterate to the Senate Mr Albanese's announcement today that a federal Albanese Labor government will initiate a new force posture review upon coming to office. The Indo-Pacific would remain a key focus and the review would ensure that the government is considering both long-term strategic posture and given the fast-moving events in the region, short-term imperatives. And the re review would also respond to the continued emergence of cyber security as a central challenge to Australia's strategic positioning in the coming decade. The relationship with the US is far deeper than a security alliance alone. The United States has been a core economic partner of Australia and its importance only continues to grow. It remains our key capital investor underpinning Australian innovation and driving both our countries to take advantage of emerging technologies. At the foundation of our shared economic prosperity is the global rules-based order, the systems, norms and institutions that guide the world's interactions and govern disputes. These are the rules of the road and they are being tested in new ways. A global pandemic that continues to wreak havoc, terrorism and extremism that continue to find safe haven, the return of great power competition, the undermining of rules-based trade, the use and the use of economic coercion for strategic ends. The US and Australia have been close allies in building and strengthening these rules of the road, including in our region, but we need to do more and we can only do more with friends and partners. So we welcome the return of American leadership in the rules-based order under President Biden and his dedicated effort to repair alliances. I've said before that Australia's partnerships and leadership in the Indo-Pacific is our pr principal value add to the alliance. And we have an opportunity and responsibility to work closely with this, the administration as it develops its Indo-Pacific strategy, including building its economic footprint, particularly in Southeast Asia. We must work with key partners such as India, Japan, Indonesia and other ASEAN nations, South Korea, the EU and others to strengthen both economic engagement and to uphold the rules of the road. This is because as much as America's role has changed, its unique capacity to offer balance in the region and leadership in the international order means it remains the indispensable power. Many of our neighbours want the balance that will come from greater US engagement, and they are clear that must be economic engagement as well as security partnerships. So we should be doing all we can to encourage the US to support Indo-Pacific regional pandemic recovery, reinforce ASEAN centrality, and strengthen regional architecture. So we welcome the recent visits by Vice President Harris and Defence Secretary Austin to Southeast Asia and see these as important first steps in the US step up in the region. We hope to see this grow rapidly in recognition of the vital strategic importance of this region, and we must be prepared to step up our own engagement to support it. At a time when regional uncertainty is high, a deeper US commitment to ensuring all states have the capacity to protect their sovereignty is vitally important. And President Biden's early embrace of the Quad was a welcome development, and there will be much opportunity for further US-Australia co cooperation in that context as well. While so much of the region's immediate focus is the response to COVID, its more profound concern is climate change and how we address climate change demonstrates our engagement and alignment with our neighbours. It is, of course, in Australia's interests as a continent highly vulnerable to the worst impacts of climate change that we urgently apply ourselves to the task of reducing emissions, not only because the costs of climate change are so great for us, but also because the world's climate emergency is Australia's job opportunity. And because anything less would undermine Australian leadership in the region, leave vacuums for others to fill and abandon those most vulnerable to the worst impacts of a changing climate. In the United States, senior leaders have talked for years about the security implications of climate change. We know it is having geostrategic and regional impacts, as well as direct impacts on defence systems, infrastructure and operations. Secretary of Defence Austin has already identified climate change as a top priority for the US military. At his Fullerton address in July this year, he described climate change as an existential threat and a challenge we must meet together, echoing what Pacific Island leaders have been saying for decades. The US military has, has acknowledged that climate change is not a future defence problem, but an immediate challenge. And it is time that the Australia-US alliance reflected this reality. We should deepen our cooperation on climate change security issues. We should develop capabilities and shared responsibility to respond to natural disasters, address humanitarian needs and mitigate the impacts of rising temperatures, particularly in our region. 
and we should cooperate on technological development to take advantage of the economic opportunity that comes from the shift to clean energy to deliver cheaper energy prices and facilitate an expansion of high value manufacturing capability. This helps build economic resilience in the event of future shocks. So an Albanese Labor government would make comprehensive cooperation on climate change a hallmark of alliance cooperation, because we recognise that Australia's own action on climate change will shape our capacity to live in a region where our interests prosper in partnership with our neighbours and our American ally. And we recognise that this is central to the next phase of an alliance with the United States, that Labor has always innovated, and that reflects the abiding friendship, trust and affection between our peoples. Senator Steele-John, then I'll come to you. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. The government has brought this motion here to the chamber today, uh, a day after the last uh, American force left Afghanistan and about a week from uh, the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks in the United States. They ask us today to unquestioning, unquestioningly endorse the American alliance and to recommit ourselves to a relationship that we have had militarily with the United States for 70 years. To do this would be easy uh, politically. It is the united view of the major parties that a military relationship such as we currently have with the United States is uh, a good thing for Australia. Certainly a good thing for them. It's given them many opportunities to stand yet next to US military equipment and to go on fancy visits overseas and meet with defence secretaries and secretaries of state and feel like significant global actors. To do so, though, in the closing days of 20 years of conflict and war across the world that was unleashed by the 9-11 attacks would be, however, to do a great disservice to the Australian community and to those peoples and nations that were so savagely harmed in the aftermath of that event. It is time, 20 years on, for us to speak truth about exactly what happened in the aftermath of 9-11. To speak the truth that America, that the United States, entered into a blood rage-induced vengeful series of exercises whereby they set two nations ablaze and precipitated the loss of some 350,000 civilian lives in a desperate attempt to reclaim what they felt was a bruised national honour and to reassert themselves in the new century they took nations across the world to wage war in the Middle East based on upon lies. And when they were caught out upon those lies, they invented new reasons for a maintenance of conflict and a maintenance of occupation. Now, at that critical moment 20 years ago, Australia's political leadership had a choice. It could either engage with the United States and seek, and seek to de-escalate the crisis unfolding in the aftermath of 9-11, seek to work with the international community to bring the individual perpetrators to justice and maintain the so-called global rules-based order, which has so much been vaunted and celebrated during the course of this debate or they could validate that period of vengeful blood rage, validate the conflicts that were carried out in the aftermath, participate in them, justify them, attempt to lend them moral support. And that is the choice that they made. John Howard took us into Iraq, took us into Afghanistan, 
and Prime Minister after Prime Minister kept us there because it was in their political interest to do so. Now, we today are discussing the mechanism by which that decision was played out, the ANZUS Treaty, this year 70 years old. And as we do so, we also need to speak the truth about what that treaty is and where it comes from. There has been much spoken about ANZUS as a defence treaty that guarantees Australia a level of mutual protection. This is the myth of ANZUS, the treaty of the mind, the treaty that exists only when Australian diplomats and Australian politicians look at that piece of paper. The reality of the wording of the treaty is that it says no such thing. It offers no such guarantee. The wording of the treaty simply states that if there should be some kind of a shared a, a, a moment of a, a conflict or concern, that where they will, the parties to the treaty will act with concern to each other. It gives no guarantee of any kind of mutual protection. Below that, though, sits an even more insidious reality, which is the context in which it was conceived. This treaty was signed in 1951, and upon its signing, the relevant Australian ambassador called it a bulwark, again, the beginning of a bulwark in the defence of freedom. Now, in that context, the meaning was clear. The meaning was this will offer Australia protection against the enemies in its region, and the enemies were the people of the Asia-Pacific region. It was the beginning of a narrative of fear against the Asian people of the Asia-Pacific region, a legitimation of the idea that there was something to be fearful of, of those across our sea borders. It saw us enter into that horrific conflict, the Vietnam War. And it used to be, it used to be the case that the Labour Party understood the dangers of following along in the wake of the United States. It used to be the case that those like Gough Whitlam and Jim Cairns were on the streets with the community as they protested against these violent imperial wars. It is to be noted that Gough Whitlam removed Australian troops from Vietnam as one of his first acts of Prime Minister, as Prime Minister. And yet all of these years on, we see a Labour Party which has given up in relation to criticism of the United States, is in fact now in lockstep with the Liberal Party, ready to go all the way with the USA once again. The uncritical, unflinching nature with which the Labour Party now position itself in relation to the American alliance does a huge disservice to the community. And it fails to reflect all of those in our community who want peace, who saw through the lies of George Bush and the complicity of John Howard, who understood that there were no WMDs in Iraq, that there was no need to knock over the government of an entire nation to try to, to, try to bring to justice a single individual who by then was most likely within the borders of Pakistan. The community have always understood that when it comes to war, the number one thing on the mind of a politician is how to make electoral benefit out of it. The hard truth for the major parties is that in the aftermath of 9-11, as America had its blood haze descend and decided to line people up on the board to take its anger out at, Australian politicians sought political opportunity political opportunity to bind themselves closer to an ally which in response could deliver them many more opportunities to fancy weaponry 
with whom they are able then to take pictures and an opportunity to secure their electoral base here in Australia. It is very telling that in a moment of general global crisis, genuine global crisis, when Australia could have benefited greatly from the supply of something as simple as a vaccine, the special relationship was not strong enough to enable that to occur. It has also been commented upon that we are now seeking to engage ourselves in the hosting of missiles upon the Northern Territory. And it once again is another example of how the major parties are so willing Australia as the United States most significant and well-armed aircraft carrier in the Asia Pacific, regardless of the views of the Northern Territory, which so wholeheartedly oppose it. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Nationals uh, would seek to associate our party with the comments particularly of the Foreign Minister, but uh, also that of the opposition in uh, supporting wholeheartedly the ANZUS uh, relationship and treaty. Today we mark the 70th uh, anniversary of the alliance between Australia and the United States of America. This anniversary comes after the withdrawal from Afghanistan and ahead of the 20th anniversary of the September 11 attacks. First signed in San Francisco in 1951, the treaty confirmed both the United States and Australia's commitment to a shared vision for an Indo-Pacific that is secure, stable and prosperous. The treaty reaffirmed Australia's unwavering commitment to our alliance, recognising its fundamental importance to our nation's security and sovereignty. At the time, Australia's then ambassador to the United States, one of the architects of the treaty, Percy Spender, said, this day we declare to the world that our three peoples share a common destiny. This treaty takes the first step towards what we hope will prove to be an ever-widening system of peaceful security in this vital area. And that it has done and will continue to do so. As a nation, we've been incredibly well served in both peacetime and war by an alliance that has been a testament to our common values and deep mutual trust. This alliance and our bond with the United States is stronger, broader and more vital today than it was 70 years ago. Few countries in the world enjoy such a close relationship built upon our mutual support for democracy and shared respect for the rule of law. Our shared commitment to deterring aggression has seen us fight together in every major conflict uh, since World War I. From Lee Hamill all the way through to the evacuation we saw in Kabul last week, we've stood side by side with our mates, the United States of America and New Zealand. On the 14th of September 2001, we saw Prime Minister John Howard formally evoke the treaty for the first time in response to the September 11 terrorist attacks. And he said at the time, in every way, the attack on New York and Washington and the circumstances surrounding it did constitute an attack on the metropolitan territory of the United States of America within the provisions of Articles 4 and 5 of the ANZUS Treaty. If that treaty means anything, if our debts as a nation to the people of the United States in the darkest days of World War II means anything, if the comradeship, the friendship and the common bonds of democracy and a belief in liberty, fraternity and justice means anything, it means that the ANZUS Treaty applies and that the ANZUS Treaty is properly invoked. Australia therefore joined the coalition forces in Afghanistan, contributing to the war on terror and ensured a safer Australia, a safer world. And as it has been for the last 70 years, our alliance is set to remain indispensable from our future. The Indo-Pacific has become a focal point of our alliance, benefiting our partners throughout this region and underpinning the strong relationships we already have with these nations. Our commitment to keeping the alliance strong is shown through Australia's 2020 Defence Strategic Update, as set out in the 2024 Structure Plan, Australia's $270 billion investment in new ADF capabilities will enable Australia to be a more effective and capable alliance partner. The investment also strengthens our industrial-based collaboration to further bolster alliance interoperability and the supply chain resilience. Australia's force po posture cooperation with the US, including the Marine Rotational Force in Darwin, is a tangible demonstration of the deep engagement in the region by both Australia and the United States. 
As we look to the future, let us be reminded of the values and freedoms the ANZUS Treaty has secured for us as a nation. Let us commit to continuing to be vigilant and strong, to build the economic strength for the peace and prosperity of all and for a world that is free. Let us reflect on the sacrifices of all who have served under the flags of all three of our great nations, who will never forget and continue to honour each and every day. And let us be reminded that whatever lies ahead, Australia, New Zealand and the United States' unbreakable friendship will continue to prosper. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We will now move on to... Oh, sorry, Senator Seward. Could I record the Greens' opposition to the motion other than for section E? Thank Thanks. you. So recorded. Thank you, Senator Seward. So we'll now move on to motions to take note of answers, I believe. I'm not all here for this. So, Senator Pratt. Mr President, I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Cash to questions asked by myself. Yesterday, and indeed confirmed today in the chamber, we have heard Attorney General Senator Cash, herself a West Australian, saying that the legal pathways that led to the High Court determining that it was reasonable for WA to have closed its borders to stop the spread of COVID-19 may have a different outcome should those same policies be tested again. Things have changed, Senator Cash has said. And when is Mark McGowan going to open Western Australia up to the rest of the country? Well, I am exceedingly alarmed at these remarks. I, like Premier McGowan, and he put it best, he said, when the Morrison government went through the Clive Palmer experience last year, and that now they want to do exactly the same thing again. What kind of message is Senator Cash trying to send to Western Australians? Well, Senator Cash must take us for mugs. Of course, Western Australia can't live in a bubble forever. But to open up at 80 per cent and invite the virus in when this government has not provided enough vaccines for the other 20 per cent of Western Australians who might want to get be vaccinated to get vaccinated? What a ridiculous proposition. So if Mark McGowan rightly says, I'm not going to open up the borders automatically at 80 per cent, I'm very grateful and thankful for him saying that. And in fact, he fought in the negotiations in the National Cabinet to ensure that Western Australia, as part of agreeing to the plan, is able to keep its border protection system in place as part of agreeing to that plan. It is a ridiculous notion that Western Australia should just allow, should just allow COVID into the state when there are people who want to be vaccinated who will not be vaccinated by that point in time, including very vulnerable members of the community, older people, First Nations Australians and indeed children. It is this government's failure to roll out the vaccine and secure enough supply. So this government is instead focused on attacking premiers and chief ministers and drawing up legal schemes to force the pandemic into places where it doesn't exist already. For the Attorney General, the chief law officer in this country, to be openly advocating for future challenges to Western Australia's border um, closures is absolutely farcical. The Morrison government has spent more than a million dollars supporting Clive Palmer's failed High Court challenge. It failed, and I call on the government to move on. 
And yet we've heard Attorney General saying out of one side of her mouth that the government won't support a challenge led by Clive Palmer, but on the other hand, essentially saying that the laws are now ripe for challenging. Why won't the Attorney General pay money to support Mark McGowan and the state government against a future High Court challenge if business wants to challenge those laws? Essentially, again, the, uh, the Attorney General is siding against the state of Western Australia. And it's all very well for those opposite to say, no, she didn't. No, she didn't. That's not what she said. She said, it is open for challenge. And, and why then shouldn't the Attorney General say it is in the best interests of Western Australia for its borders to remain protected for the time being until every West Australian, every single West Australian has had an opportunity to get vaccinated if they want to be? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Askew. Well, Madam President, Deputy President, I think Senator Cash was pretty clear when she spoke earlier today. I'm not sure if Senator Pratt actually had, was in the chamber at the time. She did state that the government will not challenge state border closures in the High Court. That's pretty clear. Throughout this pandemic, the federal government has worked with premiers and chief ministers through the national cabinet process constructively to ensure the safety of all Australians. The government has a solid four-step national plan to transition Australia's national COVID-19 response. Um, just a moment, Senator Askew. I'm just going to check your mic is working. Is that what you were asking? The microphone's turned on. <clears throat> Do you want to start again? It's up to you. I could hear you, but I'm not sure it was. It probably wasn't being recorded, so perhaps start again. Okay, thank you. Well, Madam Deputy President, I think Senator Cash was pretty clear when she spoke earlier this afternoon, and I wasn't sure if Senator Pratt was actually in the chamber at the time, because she did say very clearly that the government will not challenge state border closures in the High Court. Throughout this pandemic, the federal government has worked with premiers and chief ministers through the national cabinet process very constructively to ensure the safety of all Australians. The government has a solid four-step national plan to transition Australia's national COVID-19 response. That plan is based on the Doherty Institute's COVID-19 modelling, along utilising the economic analysis conducted by the Commonwealth Department of Treasury. The national plan is supported by an overwhelming majority of the states and territories and has been agreed to at National Cabinet on more than one occasion. The government is clear we will not do anything to jeopardise the staged national plan to get us out of this pandemic. What I would like to know is what is opposition leaders Mr Albanese's and the Labor Party's position. Mr Albanese has at times backed the national plan and at other times, well, a different timeline for opening borders and ultimately Australia. Mr Albanese continues to have that each way bet on the future of Australians. Instead, he should wholeheartedly support and get behind the national plan. Madam Deputy President, as I mentioned earlier, the Doherty Institute examined COVID-19 infection and vaccination rates in order to determine the targets required for the national plan's stage pathway to living with COVID. The plan was put in place to provide assurance and comfort to all Australians that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and the plan was agreed by National Cabinet. They sought the research from the Doherty Institute and have since agreed to the way forward. So imagine the disappointment of the Australian public that we now, that we now have some premiers hesitating, stepping back from that commitment. The open letter from the business community in national papers today really says it all. The full page advertisement signed by the heads of 81 of Australia's largest businesses calls on governments across the country to work together to deliver on the plan. And I quote, as vaccination rates increase, it will become necessary to open up society and live with the virus in the same way that other countries have done. The National Cabinet has agreed to a roadmap which provides a path out of lockdowns with an easing of restrictions from 70% and 80% vaccination rates. We need to stay the course." End quote. 
CEOs and managing directors such as Stephen Kane from Coles Group, Steve Johnson from Suncorp, Taryn Gupta from Stockland, Peter King from Westpac, Jean Jones from Insitec Pivot Limited, Tom Seymour from PwC, and the extensive and very impressive list goes on. Madam Deputy President, they all understand the importance of sticking to the plan. My hope is that their plea is heard and all governments can work together to stick to the plan to enable our country to regain some semblance of normality, albeit a new norm, and allow businesses and the borders to reopen as planned. If not, jobs and businesses will be lost. Madam Deputy President, on the vaccine rollout, which has also been raised, the rollout is increasing progressively each and every month. 7.3 million vaccinations were delivered in August, 4.5 million vaccinations in July, 3.4 in June and 2.1 in May. That is a massive increase. We're administering more than 1.9 million doses every week. Last week alone, 1,929,000 doses were made up of 841,000 by state and territory health clinics, 50,362 in aged care and disability clinics, and 1,037,000 in primary care clinics. Throughout this pandemic, we have saved more than 30,000 lives, supported more than 3 million Australians through JobKeeper, and got 1 million Australians back into work. And with around 1 million Pfizer doses arriving every week, plus the additional half a million Pfizer doses that have been secured through the doses swap in Sing through Singapore and the one million doses from Poland, our health and economic recovery is well and truly on track. Madam Deputy President, we need all states and territories to come online and to make sure that we are delivering for the national plan that has been agreed and that we see a way out of this pandemic into Australia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Askew. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And um, you know, the country is yearning, yearning for a man with a plan. But there's only one plan for Mr. Morrison, and it's all about him. Only a plan for himself and his survival. Everybody else is a casualty in Mr. Morrison's plan. And we have to acknowledge that what he actually said, despite a national plan, yesterday he said, Ultimately, everything is a state matter. Under the leadership of this man with many plans and no conviction, Australia has never been more divided. States that once had open borders and open commerce have had to resort to their own powers in order to protect their people. The only interventions the Prime Minister has seen fit to make in this debate are to undermine the Atagi advice attacked some of the premiers for taking action when he does nothing, and to constantly blame everyone else for his colossal policy failures. And then, of course, he has the, the singular version of his interaction with New South Wales, encouraging Premier Gladys Berejiklian not to stick with a plan of a rapid lockdown and encouraging her not to do that. And the Bondi failure is now spreading the consequence of that bronchi failure is spreading right across the country. There's one reason that all of this chaos is happening, and that is because Mr Morrison refuses all accountability. He shirks all the tough decisions, and he thinks only about his personal short-term political gain and not the benefit of the country. Uh, for the first time in Federation, we have a head of government where the buck doesn't stop with them. As inept as Mr Abbott was and as aloof as Mr Turnbull was, can we really imagine that either of them would completely abdicate national leadership and stand up and say, ultimately, everything is a state matter? Despite the constant leaks from hotel quarantine sites, Mr Morrison's failed to build a national quarantine facility, forcing Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk, Anastasia Palaszczuk to build her own. Despite promising that all Australians would be able to return from overseas for Christmas, the Prime Minister has failed by the end of July this year, and there's still 38,000 Australians waiting to get back into the country. Despite Section 51 of the Constitution explicitly stating that the quarantine is a federal responsibility, Mr Morrison continues to do nothing to build a safe and secure facility for Australians. I have to wonder 
what this national cabinet he talks about really is. If this was a man with a plan for the country that we could trust, surely he would have created a national cabinet with the leader of the government and the leader of the opposition. He would have encouraged premiers and leaders of the opposition to come to the table and work in the national interest. Yet he couldn't wait to establish a, a, a form of cabinet, a national cabinet that's actually being critiqued as not being a cabinet and not having its uh, documents worthy of protection. But this show of a group of people across the country, a select group of people, not bipartisan, in a way that is just not delivering for the country. Nowhere has Mr Morrison's failure been more absolute than in Western Australia, uh, Western New South Wales. The Delta variant has ravaged Indigenous communities from Wilcannia to Walgett to Dubbo, and tragically, last week it claimed its first Aboriginal victim. Last week, only 6.3 per cent of the Indigenous population in Western New South Wales was vaccinated, despite repeated warnings of the government from myself and Aboriginal health leaders. And it's a long way from 6.3 per cent to the 70 and 80 per cent that this government keeps talking about. The Prime Minister's failure to secure an adequate supply of Pfizer for the disproportionately young Aboriginal populations of Western New South Wales has condemned them to lockdown in their homes, isolation in tents, trying to find refuge in their own cars separate from their family, while the deadly virus is alive and moving around their community. Mr Morrison's plan for Indigenous people was announced in March of 2020. He announced that there were going to be vaccines. Here we are in September 2021 with only 6.3 per cent of the population of Western New South Wales who are Indigenous people vaccinated. That's how useless Mr Morrison's plans are. The goal he articulates might be what Australians want to hear, but the man it is incapable of delivering it. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Chandler. Thank you. Madam Deputy President, um, in rising to take note of answers provided by um, Minister Cash in question time today, there's, there's one point that I want to start with, and it's a point that I have made a number of times coming into this place, contributing <clears throat> in debates such as these um, in this chamber, and, and that is that there is not a single nation Madam Deputy President, in the world, um, not a single government that I think would claim to have made all the right decisions when dealing with this pandemic and to have dealt with the situation absolutely superbly and perfectly. But what is important is that we learn about what works with this virus and what doesn't. We adapt and we move forward to counter the challenges that it provides to us. And, Madam Deputy President, we have learned, we are adapting and we are moving forward. What doesn't do us any good, though, during a pandemic, Madam Deputy President, um, is partisan politicking. Um, and quite frankly, that is what we have seen here from the Labor Party today. They have not listened to the responses provided by ministers in this place. I've been here two years and now. I've come to get used to that. They are not listening to what is being told to them in question time. They are manipulating uh, the words of Senator Cash and turning it into something that, quite frankly, uh, it isn't. But should I be surprised, Madam Deputy President, we tend to get, uh, we tend to get that from them every day. This pandemic is fast moving and constantly evolving. And like I said, no government um, has got it exactly right or, or claims to have got it exactly right. And it makes you ask, why is it that all Labor has to offer to go, um, at this point is to go back in time to 12 months ago, 18 months ago, um, instead of working to ensure that everyone is on the same page and everyone is working to the national plan that was agreed by all states and territories at the National Cabinet. The Coalition Government, Madam Deputy President, is continuing with the critical work to get Australians vaccinated to keep us safe, 
get us back into work, keep the economy turning over, end the lockdowns and ensure that people can cross borders unrestricted. Millions of Australians are struggling with community lockdowns, border closures that prevent them from seeing their friends and their family. And it is just heartbreaking, Madam Deputy President. I hear each and every day from people, whether it's in my home state of Tasmania or across the country, that are frustrated with the lockdowns. They are frustrated with the, the restrictions. They want to be able to see their family and their friends face to face. And sadly, that is not possible at the moment. But that is why we have the national plan to get vaccination rates to 70 or 80 per cent so that we can open up safely, get our kids back into school, get Australians back to work, get our economy moving again and give people the opportunity to reunite with their loved ones who they haven't been able to see for so long. The National Plan shifts the focus from continued suppression of community transmission to post-vaccination settings focused on preventing serious illness and fatalities where the public health management of COVID-19 becomes consistent with other infectious diseases. I think I said this close to 18 months ago in this place, Madam Deputy President, we need to learn to live with the virus. We absolutely need to learn to live with the virus, and vaccinating Australians is a really key part of learning to live with the virus. Once we have Australians vaccinated, we will be able to get back to living our lives closer to what we all remember as being normal. Uh, currently, over 19 million doses have been administered across the country, and if we continue on the rates that we have been on, Madam Deputy President, we should hit the 20 million mark by the end of the week, and that is incredibly uh, exciting. I'm also advised that 60 per cent of eligible Tasmanians in my home state are now protect protected with at least one dose, um, while more than 42 per cent are fully vaccinated, which is fantastic news for my home state of Tasmania and certainly a testament to the hard work of the state Liberal government led by Peter Gutwin there, of course, supported by the Morrison Liberal team um, in ensuring that we are rolling out the vaccination program locally. Uh, importantly, the government continues to make new arrangements and deals to secure additional dosages for the nation so that we can continue with this rollout to ensure that we can get back to normal. Make no mistake, we as a government are doing everything in our power to expedite the vaccination program and progress the national plan so we can reach a point where extended lockdowns and border restrictions you, are Senator a thing of the Sandra, past. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Um, well, it was indeed um, very refreshing to hear a member of the government benches congratulate a Labor state premier uh, for doing a good job in this pandemic today. Uh, it was very refreshing to hear Senator Cash acknowledge Mr McGowan uh, and his incredible hard work to keep the people of his home state, Western Australia, safe. Uh, and it was as refreshing as a cool change in a heat wave because the members of this government have done nothing but pile heat onto Labor state premiers during this pandemic. They have done nothing but pile on to Labor state premiers uh, and to the people that they represent. Uh, they've done nothing but pile on to Labor state premiers who have been doing everything that they can to keep Australians safe, making the tough decisions, making the difficult calls, uh, making those calls to keep all of us safe. Uh, and right now, Victorians who are locked down, well, we can only imagine what our lives would be like if Mr Morrison had spent last year doing his job uh, instead of attacking Victorians, instead of attacking our state premier, instead of attacking the measures that were put in place in Victoria to keep us all safe. Because Victorians know that we would not be in this situation, we would not be locked down yet again if the Prime Minister had only done his two jobs. His two jobs of rolling out the vaccine and of establishing federal uh, dedicated open air quarantine facilities. Um, if only he had secured those vaccines for the start of this year, uh, instead of saying that it's how you end the race at the end of the year that matters. 
Um, if only he had understood the whole time that it was always a race. It was always a race. If only he had fronted up to his two jobs, the two jobs that Australians needed him to do. Speedy rollout of the vaccinations and purpose built quarantine. If only the Prime Minister had spent his time on that instead of spending his time on attacking Victorians. Uh, instead of spending his time funding Clive Palmer's attack on the WA government and on the WA government's health response. Uh, instead, what we have seen from this Prime Minister is 18 months of a Prime Minister avoiding his responsibility, looking for others to blame, blaming states for lockdowns caused by his failure to build purpose-built quarantine facilities. Um, caused by his failure in relying on leaky hotel quarantine, uh, hotels that were built for tourists not to keep a virus from entering the community. Um, if only the Prime Minister hadn't spent his time um, blaming the very people who really need to be vaccinated for not being able to access the vaccines. Um, blaming essential workers, blaming Indigenous people for his failure to vaccinate those vulnerable populations. Uh, and now this week, the Prime Minister doesn't even try to hide his aversion, his extreme aversion to taking responsibility in this crisis, uh, saying this week that ultimately everything is a state matter. Um, well, we know what the Prime Minister's responsibilities are. We know who is ultimately responsible. We know who has ultimately failed on vaccines and on quarantine, uh, and that it is Prime Minister Morrison. He failed to heed the advice of his own health advisers and invest in fit for purpose quarantine facilities. Uh, instead, claiming again and again and again that the hotel quarantine system was effective, that it was 99.9% .9 effective. Well, tell that to the 60% of Australians who are locked down today. Um, tell that to the children who are missing school. Tell that to all of the people who have lost their jobs. Tell that to all of the people who are relying on disaster payments. Uh, and what Australians want from the Prime Minister right now is leadership. They want him to do his job. They want him to take responsibility. They want him to bring people together not to divide us, not to shift blame, to take responsibility. Thank you, Senator Walsh. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Pratt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given to me by Senator Birmingham in relation to the reports that there is a new push on inside the government uh, to fund chaplains to deal with the young people of Australia's concern about climate change. Sending a chaplain into every school to allay their fears in relation to the state of the planet, the environment and the state of our climate. Well, what I mean, this is bonkers. This is crazy. You couldn't make this stuff up. Rather than dealing with the reality of climate change and what we have to do, which is reduce pollution, we've got Prime Minister Scott Morrison and members of his government wanting to send in the chaplains to tell the kids it's all going to be OK. The last thing we need is to send more chaplains into schools at a time when young people actually need the government to show leadership. The only people robbing young people of a future and hope in this country is the members of the Prime Minister's government who continue to delay and deny the action needed for climate change. The only people in this country, those within the government who delay and deny, and their mates in the fossil fuel industry who continue to want to pollute putting the profits, their profits, their mega profits, ahead of the future of our planet and the future of our young people. It is just unthinkable that this government, rather than doing what they are required to do, they want to blame young people's anxiety and concern about the state of our environment 
on climate activists and scientists. Is there, any, is there anything that this Prime Minister won't try and shift the blame on? The Prime Minister is off to Oh, he's going to be sending delegates to Glasgow ahead of uh, the World Climate Summit in November. I mean, how is this going to go down there? Are we going to send the chaplains to represent Australia at the Global Summit to allay the fears of the rest of the world's leaders and scientists that we have indeed hit code red when it comes to our climate? We need science-led solutions not religious chaplains in schools. And let me say, I know that young people in this country are finding it really tough. They are worried about the, their future. They are anxious about the state of the environment. They are worried about the stresses and the threats of COVID-19. The last thing we should be doing is palming off this concern to religious chaplains in schools. If we want to look after the mental health of our young people, we should be putting in qualified counsellors and social workers, people who will be there to listen to our young people, not to push religion and ideology. I mean, this is just crazy stuff. You didn't think this government could get much worse. And the Prime Minister can have whatever beliefs he wants, but to pretend that the genuine concerns of Australia's young people and children in relation to climate change is simply alarmist and not based on reality is negligent. It is absolutely negligent. We need a government who will be prepared to take climate change seriously, reduce pollution, commit to a proper target for 2030 at the Global Summit, and to listen to the concerns of children and young people as legitimate things to act on. And the only things chaplains in schools should be doing is telling the young people of Australia to pray that their parents vote this mob out. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices?